Hi, Ram. Uh, thank you for joining in today. Um, so this position, uh, you know, we saw a couple of resumes and your resume was one such as resume, you know, which called which caught all our eyes. Uh, there were a couple of interesting projects uh, that we really like and your work experience directly aligned to the work that we are doing in our organization. So so if you don't mind, can you can you uh, give um, a brief about uh, yourself or let's say can you walk us through your resume? Sure. Hi, Mil. Thank you so much for connecting with me today. It's a pleasure to be here to be interviewing with you guys. Uh, so let me begin with a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I'm Ram. I'm currently a master's in quantitative finance student at Rutgers Business School. Uh, prior to doing this, I did my bachelor's in applied mathematics from San Jose State. Uh, currently, I'm working as a quant research associate with Bellweather Consulting, where we work with institutional clients and help them provide uh, and provide them with 401k uh, plan recommendations and help them um, design the lineups for their employees. Okay, understood. Uh, so right now, uh, I see like you, are, you uh, so you are working with Bell Weather and you have also worked as a uh, graduate research assistant at Rutgers University. So I'm, I'm just curious, can you walk me through some of the projects that you did at uh, Rutgers University? Sure. Uh, one of the projects that I did uh, at Rutgers uh, involved credit risk modeling via machine learning. Uh, so basically what I did was I was trying to analyze uh, which are the factors that contribute uh, to a risk model for when you're trying to determine if someone is going to default on a loan or not. And I was trying to predict if a customer of a bank will default on a loan or not. So in that whole process, uh, it was via through, we were analyzing a, ca a capital data set which contained uh, certain records of people who had applied for a loan. And then we were also given a default probability uh, whether the person will default or not. And that was given by a one and a zero. So one was assigned to someone who would default and zero was assigned to someone who would not default. And I did, uh, so I used a couple of techniques in this project. One of the techniques that I used was light GBM and the other one was logistic regression. So combining these two techniques, I was able to find out two models, uh, one for each um, type of uh, method that I was using and how um, efficient they were. Another project that I was working on uh, was for fixed income, where I was trying to build a yield curve out of uh, out of the given data that we had. I was also trying to conduct duration and uh, DVO1 hedging, and then also trying to um, also trying to value uh, derivatives like floors and caps. And then moving on to the next project was basically kind of an option pricing model. Uh, I took the Heston stochastic uh, equations, implemented those in Python, and got a price out of that for option, for Apple's option. And then the main goal of the project was to calibrate uh, the model to uh, the actual market prices. And the way that you do that is through reducing mean squared error. So basically, we try to reduce the mean squared error between what the prices a model predicted and what the model, and what was the actual model price or what was the actual prices in the market. And then you could calibrate your parameters according to that. And then I also implemented implemented the Black Scholes model along with it as to just to check uh, how like what is the comparison, which model forms better, which had a better efficiency, things like that. And then another project was uh, for an indexing class. So basically I created an index that captures advancements in the AI sector. So basically companies like NVIDIA, AMD, uh, but not just limited to the US sector, but all over the world. And we did that by various factors like incorporating size, liquidity, volume, and all these things. And then we created a fact sheet, a rule book, and we presented that to industry veterans. Yeah, understood. So let's let's uh, how I want to keep this interview is uh, let's work on one. You know, I'll ask a couple of questions for like different projects that you did, and then we'll we'll be moving forward with the rest of your working experience. Sure. So let's let's start with uh, derivatives and numerical methods that you use for option pricing model. So can yeah. you tell me like what is uh, the major difference between Black Scholl model and uh, Heston uh, Heston model like? Uh, why the Heston model, you know, came into place and what were some of the limitations of black Scholl model? Sure. So let's begin with the black Scholl model. One of the things that uh, with black Scholl model, it assumes that the volatility is, is constant. However, in the Heston model, that's the kind of advantage it provides you. It assumes that the volatility is a Brownian motion and a random walk. 
and changes over time. So basically, the volatility today is just uh, the volatility tomorrow will just be dependent on the volatility today and not the previous values. And this is independent of that. Some of the limitations of black holes that are attached with it is that a black holes assumes that the market is efficient. There are no transaction costs involved. Um, they assume that there are no arbitrage uh, opportunities in the market available. Uh, some other assumptions with the black holes model are that they assume that the returns are long. Uh, the returns are log normally distributed. Uh, they also assume that their volatility is constant. That's why we use Heston uh, model. And then uh, they also assume that the that your risk free rate also stays constant throughout the period of option pricing. Mm -hmm. And any other which you think you are missing on, like. Uh, so we covered uh, the returns should be normally distributed. Uh, the volatility is constant. The risk free rate is constant. Uh, they assume that no dividends are paid out uh, throughout the period. Uh, and they also assume no transaction costs uh, are involved and the whole market is acts in an efficient way. And one of the assumptions is it is used to price uh, European uh, options. European options. Yeah. Yes. yeah, okay. So uh, so can you tell me like the mathematical uh, equation of uh, Heston model? Sure. So the Heston model is basically it. Uh, it has two mathematical equations. One of the one of the equation is for stock price, and one of the equation is for is for volatility. The first equation of stock price is that you take the risk free rate and you multiply it uh, by the first derivative of the stock price, and then you also add a volatility component to it. Uh, and then for the volatility uh, uh, equation, uh, basically you incorporate a Brownian motion in the into the volatility uh, equation and the volatility. What it does that it assumes that everything that is available today has already been priced in the market and there's no new information uh, on which the volatility can change. But can you tell me like I understand like the re like uh, the processes of it, but can you tell me like the mathematical equation? Uh, I don't remember the exact terms of it. Uh, I just yeah. Okay. Um. So let's say um uh, like um let's say if you. If you're working on a black shoal, let's say if you're working on black shoal model, right? And it is used for European option, right? So let's say if I want to uh, take, uh, let's say American option, right? So can you tell me like what other, uh, what what other models can I use for pricing uh, American option? Well, something that is uh, valuable in pricing American option is the binomial tree model. So bin binomial tree model is basically a, uh, a model which assumes that there's a constant probability will, with which the stock will go up or down. And we move, when we use the binomial model, we move to the risk neutral world. In the risk neutral world, we assume that investors don't care uh, about the risk uh, and they're uh, not usually risk averse. Uh, what that means is that uh, all your securities would give you the same uh, return as the risk free rate. And the risk free rate um, is something as the rate of return used uh, in that model. And then um, you calculate your up and down probabilities, you calculate your risk neutral uh, probabilities, and you use that uh, to see how the stock price will evolve over over time. Either the stock price can go up and either or it can come down. And basically, you create a recombining chart. From that recombining chart, you can use that to uh, calculate the value of an American option uh, at any point of time at each node. Something to consider here is that at each node, you can see whether it will it it will be optimal to exercise that American call or not. How you can do that if your in intrinsic value is greater than the time value, you'll uh, exercise it. If it's not, then you'll not exercise it. Understood. Uh, do you know any situation wherein binomial model uh, converges to black hole? Like, is do you think does that happen uh, in the first place? That does happen, and that happens when you have infinitely long time steps. So when you have infinitely long long time steps, your model will always converge to black holes. Right, right, uh, definitely. Uh, so moving on, can you like uh, can you because you know uh, like if you see black shell model, uh, one of the key component of black shell model because how the way it is derived is we assume like you know the stock follows geometric Brownian motion, right? And Brownian. Uh, so can you tell like what are the can you tell me like the properties of Brownian motion? Sure. So Brownian motion is basically uh, like a random walk, and it assumes that. Um, 
all the data that is given to you has already been priced in the market and there's no new information available. And uh, the future state will only be dependent on the current state and not the past uh, states. Uh, some assumptions that are related to it is that it follows a normal distribution. Uh, and uh, the mean, uh, there's a constant mean over time while your variance is also constant. Um, I I'm asking about the properties of Brownian motion. Like one of the properties is um, Brownian motion is continuous in nature, right? There are no there are no discrete. Uh, second is it Brownian motion is both Martin L and Markov. So yes, you... <laughs> I kind of forgot okay, no. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. So, like, uh, some of the properties is Brownian motion is both Martin and Markov. Uh, second is it is continuous in nature. Uh, third is uh, it starts Brownian motion the B naught value, which is like the starting point. It is zero, and the fourth is uh, it it follows IID, which is um, independent, mm -hmm. uh, in, independent and uh, uh, this uh, independent increment Gaussian increments is what it considers. So these are you know some properties of it. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. moving on to your uh, fixed income project, right? You you mentioned that you were okay. working on building yield curves uh, using bootstrapping methods. Uh, so so can you uh, tell me like what is what are like what is an yield curve and what are different types of yield curve that you observe in the market? Sure. So a yield curve is basically a chart which describes uh, how your uh, yields uh, how your yields are with respect to different maturities. Uh, for example, uh, it will have maturities from six months to thirty year, and each uh, at each point of time, you will be able to see uh, where the yields are uh, mm -hmm. with respect to each mat each maturity. Mm -hmm. And what was the other part of your question? And the second part is, what are different types of yield curve that one note that in, uh, that someone or let's say that the investor notices and in, in the market. Sure. Uh, one of the common yield curves there in the market is the hump-shaped hump yield curve. That is the most common yield curve. Then we have the inverted yield curve, and then we have the flat yield curve. Uh, in a yeah, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, in a hump-shaped yield curve, your short-term interest rates are lower than your uh, long-term interest rates. In a flat term, in a flat yield curve, your short-term interest rates are almost the same as your long-term interest rates. Mm -hmm. And inverted yield curve, your short-term rates are higher. Uh, in the long uh, than a long-term interest rates. So if you see the yield curve in the current scenario, what we have, it's an inverted yield curve. That means your long-term, your short-term interest rates are higher than your long-term interest rates. Right. And you mentioned that you uh, you calculated DV01. And so can you tell me what is uh, like the difference between DV01 and PV01? Actually, I am not aware of PV01 at all. So P Okay, so PV01, we calculate for a portfolio. Okay, for so basically PV01 would be just, uh, you if your portfolio consists of bonds, or different bonds, what you need to do is just you take the uh, combined uh, yield of the portfolio, you shift the yield by one basis point, and you see how what are the fluctuations in the price of your portfolio, like how much is the portfolio up and down, and that is a PV01. Uh, and DB01 is basically when we do it for a single bond rather than a portfolio. Yeah. So let's say you have, uh, let's say you have two bonds, okay? Uh, one is, let's say, a three, three month bond and a three year bond, or let's say a 30 year bond, right? Uh, which will have higher interest rate risk? So 30 year bond will have high, uh, assuming that both of them pay coupons, right? Yeah. Uh, so, thirty-year bond would have have higher credit risk because, uh, first of all, uh, there are two factors. Or what I think uh, is that since it has a longer maturity, uh, you are getting coupon payments either it's got quarterly, annually, or semi-annually. So the person has a more has the more has more time to default on their coupon uh, coupon payments and hence has a higher credit risk as compared to a three-month uh, T bill in which uh, you know that in the next three months you want to get the payment. Uh, but if you see all the treasuries, those those are issued by the government, right? So, yes. in respect of the maturity, don't you think like treasuries will have a very low credit risk? And back to my question, my question was, which which has a higher interest rate risk? Okay, 
so similarly, so if you talk about tragedies, US tragedies will have the same credit risk. Uh, I was talking, uh, I thought of normal bonds, or corporate bonds, okay. which are issued. Okay. And if you talk about interest rate risk, then your 30 year bond will have more interest rate risk. This is because the duration of the 30 year bond will be much higher than duration of a three month bond. And duration uh, is basically the sensitivity of uh, how the bond price will change with, with respect to how the yield will change. And uh, since if the interest rates fluctuate a lot uh, in the 30 year period, your bond will your bond has the ability to lose a lot of money in the 30 year period. Okay, understood. Um, can you can you tell me like um what are like different types of duration? Because I understand like there is one modified duration, second is Macaulay, third is dollar duration. So can yeah. you define like what is each of them? Sure. Uh, so modified uh duration. Uh, is basically your interest. Uh, basically, you calculate the interest rate sensitivity of your bond, uh, of your bond, of your bond. And how you do it is you you calculate the present value of all the cash flows and you multiply it by the time at which each cash flow was taken. You take the sum of those uh, of that result and you divide it by the price of the bond. Uh, that will give you the modified duration. For Macaulay's duration, what you'll do is, is you'll divide it by one plus your YTM divided by two, and that'll give you Macaulay's duration. Uh, the more commonly used in the market is Macaulay's duration, as Macaulay's duration uh, will tell us how much a bond will lose the value uh, if the interest rates go up by 1%. Like what is dollar duration? Uh, I'm not really aware of dollar duration. Okay. So, um, you know, you like, um, basically if you see a uh, duration, right, it assumes a linear relationship, right? Yes. So do you think like the linear relationship between, uh, the bond price and the interest rate, the, is, is it true that it follows a linear relationship? Like uh, what are not. your views on that? Yeah. It is not. So this, uh, the relationship is actually curved and duration is only valid when there's small shift in the curve. If you have a large shift, it is not able to measure that shift accurately. And that's why we use con convexity. Convexity is a second derivative of price with respect to the interest rate changes. And it measures the curvature of the relationship between your YTM and your price of the bond. Okay. And let's say... Um... Because uh, let's say if we do not have convexity in place, let's assume we do not have convexity. Do you think is there any other way we can, uh, you know, calculate? Is there any other metrics that we can use to understand the, you know, change in, uh, change in price of the bond with respect to change in change in uh, interest rates? TV one would be another method there, and then you have duration. Um... Um, like so, have you heard about key rate duration? The uh, so, of... Yes. So key rate duration is basically when we're trying to measure uh, the sensitivity of the bond at specific uh, points in the yield. For example, if I'm a long-term investor and I buy the bond for 30 years, I would want to measure it for the key rate of 30 years. That means I'm trying to see how much will my how much is my bond sensitive to the 30-year YTM. So is it just the 30 year that you will check or is it like on each maturity you will find uh, you will find like the change in so, change uh, in price with respect to change in interest. So it will be at each maturity that you'll find uh, the change in prices. Okay, so yeah, that's the right thing. Basically, you'll find the the duration at each the key rate duration, which is like the change in price with respect to change in interest rate at each maturity, and then you will add it yes. to come up to come up with the key rate duration. Okay. Um yeah, so um okay, that answers my question. So let's say if you have a zero coupon bond uh for five years, right? What will be the duration of it? Uh so it'll be just five years. Uh basically a zero coupon bond uh has the duration uh, the duration is the same the maturity of the bond. Uh this is because it does not pay any coupons and all the money that you'll get is at the end of maturity of the bond. Okay. Uh, you you uh, you have written that you have worked you have basically implemented and simulated Vesi check and Hull White model. Yes. Uh, so can you tell me like uh, what are the shortcomings of Vesi check model? Sure. Uh, before I talk about Vesi check model, I would like to talk about the Morton model. So uh, we do uh, so when we are trying to model interest rates, we try to model the short rate uh, as we see as expectation hypothesis tells us that 
a long term uh, future rates are uh, are actually just expectations of what is going to happen in the short rate in the future. So basically, with the interest rates model, we try to model the short rate. One of the methods we do that is through the model model and then the Vasicic model. So the Merton model introduces uh, a term called trend in the model. Um, uh, it allows uh, the model to uh, basically have a downward cup, uh, downward uh, downward shape, and that is the hump uh, hump based shape. Uh, of the YTM. Uh, and then when we shift to the Vasicic model, the Vasicic model introduces the mean diversion term as well, keeping the trend term. Some of the drawbacks with that is that your interest rates are still, the interest rates being produced can still be negative. What that can lead to is being lead to overpricing of derivatives, especially for like caps and flows. And then another short uh, short shortcoming of that is that it only allows for parallel shifts. It does not allow for, um, uh, it does not allow for a shift uh, in the curvature uh, and this accounts for small level shifts. Um, something else uh, is that um, it again assumes that the volatility is constant uh, in the model and that is solved by the CIR model moving on. Like, Can you also tell me what is like Hull, Hull White model which you have implemented? Sure. So when we talk about Vasicic model, uh, we talk about the trend term and the mean diverting term. In the Vasicic model, the trend term is stay, stays constant over time and we just assume a single value for it and it doesn't change. However, when we go to the Hull-White uh, model, it assumes that the trend term is also changing with time. Uh, what uh, it, it basically helps you to, to better act, uh, to better forecast your short rates. Uh, do you know any limitations of Hull White model? Uh, again, I think one of the limitations with Hull White model it uh, it assumes that the volatility uh, is constant uh, uh, throughout the whole period. Okay, understood. Okay, so uh, can you can you also tell me like you worked on some indexing and ETF stuff at Nexus AI? Like, uh, what is it and like? Yeah, what was the overall work you did like sure. step by step? Sure. So basically, uh, this was done for a class called indexing in ATF. Uh, this was a project in which we were asked to come up with an index which we thought would be useful in the future. Uh, creating an index is not a straightforward uh, process. You have to keep a lot of things in mind. Uh, for example, uh, one of the things uh, that uh, we thought uh, would be beneficial for the investors in the future would be to create an index that follows artificial intelligence stocks and attracts the artificial intelligence stocks globally. How we did that is that we took companies which had which were greater in size. That means we took large cap companies in the AI sector. And then uh, some other factor that we incorporated was liquidity. The company must have an average daily trading volume of 30%. Why we did that, we wanted to make sure that our index is liquid enough for people to come in and uh, like buy it and sell uh, in minutes. They shouldn't have to wait for liquidity to come in and make the investment and make the profits, take the profits away. Um, something else that we uh, did was that when we created the index, we wrote all the rules of it. One of the rules was that we didn't allow any of the security to exceed 5% uh, in our index. We did that to make sure our index is not uh, overly concentrated. As you know, one of the key rules is finance is that diversify. Don't put your eggs in one basket. That was our goal while we, while we were setting this 5% cap on each security. And once we created the index, we calculated the performance of the index, how the index has performed in the past uh, in different time periods. We also did some stress testing uh, scenarios. Uh, for example, we saw how index would have performed if a pandemic like COVID happened again. And this was done by looking at the periods of 2019 to 2021 and saw how, how stocks and index performed then. And then we encapsulated everything in a rule book we created a mythology, methodology for an index and we created and we presented it to an industry panel. Um, uh, okay. One question, are we allowed to speak uh, if we have something or no? Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, I, um, I would like to hear uh, such an... If, uh, if you have any questions, uh, like if you want to ask any mock interview questions, you can ask, but yeah. But it should be good, yeah. 
Oh, okay. No, no. I, uh, on his index that he spoke, uh, can I uh, speak? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So, so Ram, uh, one of the interesting things, I don't know how many people you know, uh, there's a big difference between how DAO is composed and how S&P is composed. Yes. As an index calculation. Uh, do you know the difference? Uh, so uh, S&P is basically market cap weighted. And uh, what that means is that uh, it sees your weight of each company is de is defined on how the how large the market cap or how big that's each fine company. good enough <laughs> so you know it you know so dow is a price weighted index yes. and second is i think one of the things you mentioned is so you were constructing a portfolio not an index i mean in a portfolio i mean what what you described was that you constructed a portfolio not an index in an index you cannot define what is the percentage of the uh stock right if the price increases, say Nvidia just you know balloon past everything in the last two months, you know yeah. from roughly four fifty to nine hundred. So you cannot have the percentage of the index, right? It's right. it's it's more of a portfolio that you constructed, not the index, right? Okay. Thank you, Sachin. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Sachin. Like those were really you know nice questions. Uh, Ram, like, did you like when you said there were different stocks in your index, right? How did you how did you do optimization? Uh, so basically, this was not an optimization project. It was more of uh, creating a universe. So once you have uh, the process begins by de by defining the universe. Our our universe was defined by companies that are working in the AI sector, or are actually generating some cash revenues from the AI sector. And then once you have your index, uh, once you have your uh, eligible universe, you try to short it down by applying some constraints on it. One, so one of the constraints that I told you about was average daily trading volume, that we wanted it to be more than 30%. Something else that you could be looking at is a free float, uh, like how much shares of each company is available in the market. That is also done to ensure there's enough liquidity in the market. So we applied these kind of constraints and we narrowed it down to a list of 20 stocks which we thought that these met a criteria for um, something valuable. Understand. understand. Um, so let's let's understand like what you did at Bellwether Consulting. Uh, I understand. Can can you like walk walk me through like some of the projects you you are working on here? Yeah. Sure. Uh, so with in Bellwether Consulting, uh, I'll basically give you a background of what Bellwether Consulting does. So Bellwether Consulting uh, is a consulting firm where we uh, help institution clients uh, and we cater their needs in the 401k plan for their employees. Uh, so if right now, and I know that you're working as Charles Schwab's at a, in a manager position. So every month, some part of your paycheck goes to goes towards your retirement savings. And uh, what it does that you choose a, in a fund, whether it's an index fund or whether it's an actively managed fund. And your savings goes into that uh, fund so what we do is basically we design the lineup for employees like you uh, so that you can see what are the available options in the market right now and where you can invest and these lineups are very carefully created because we act as fiduciaries and we want to make sure that every um, every choice that you have is a valid choice in the market right now and uh, is not a bad choice uh, what I personally did there, one of the projects was that I uh, created a factor modeling tool. So what the factor modeling tool does is that it, ta it takes a fund's return. It takes the returns of a specific factors like uh, style, size, volatility, liquidity, liquidity, and yield. So basically these returns are posted by MSCI every month. Uh, and these returns basically tell you how much a factor has contributed to the overall performance of the economy or the stock market. So base, uh, I constructed a factor model like the Pharma French uh, factor model. And uh, with this factor model, I was able to tell from which factor is the fund generating its returns from or how much uh, is each factor contributing to the returns of the fund. Uh, and these this I was basically able to tell by the coefficients uh, uh, that are the options that I got when I when I ran a, a time series regression. Okay, understood. So coming on regression, right? I mean, because I understand all the farmer French tree factor or in general like factor modeling, it it uses a lot of regression modeling in place. Uh, can you tell me like what are the assumptions of linear regression? Sure. Uh, so first 
first and the most basic assumption with linear regression is that there has to be a relationship between your independent variable and your dependent variables. Uh, and the relationship has to be linear. How we measure that is using a, uh, a metric called a correlation coefficient. A correlation coefficient can be ranging from uh, minus one to one. A correlation coefficient of one would tell you that it's a perfectly linear relationship and it's a positive linear relationship. That if your dependent variables are going up, your independent variables will also go up. A zero will tell you there uh, no relationship exists between your independent and dependent variables. And a negative one will tell you there's a perfectly negative relationship. Moving on to the next assumption uh, is normality. We assume that the returns uh, of uh, whatever we're trying to measure uh, are normally distributed. What that means is it is that it follows a bell-shaped uh, curve uh, with a given mean and a, a constant variance. The third, uh, the uh, the third assumption that we uh, do is that there should be no multicollinearity. What that means is that the dependent variables should not be uh, linearly dependent upon each other. And if that happens, that means you're not able to try. You're not able to figure out where are which factor contributes how much because uh, it kind of your variables can clash and uh, if they're uh, dependent upon each other linearly. Your fourth assumption is that uh, there is no heteroscedasticity. What that means is the residuals uh, uh, or the error terms are basically uh, distributed with a constant variance, mm -hmm. um, uh, with a constant variance. And your fifth assumption uh, is that there is no autocorrelation. Uh, autocorrelation means that uh, the the value today is dependent upon the past values. We do not want that happening as um, we do not want that happening, and that's why we keep the uh, assumption of there's no autocorrelation in the model. So, uh, so let's say if uh, because as you said, like there should be no autocorrelation between the residuals. Uh, my question is, what if there's uh, what if there's a autocorrelation? What will be your next steps? Or let's say what will happen if there's an autocorrelation between residuals? Do you know like what will be the key? What will happen? Uh, so if you have. Uh, so if you have autocorrelation between your residuals, the model can produce bias coefficients. What that means is the coefficient would not be ultimately accurate and can lead to uh, biased inferences uh, in your model. It can also lead to some of your variables being said insignificant uh, in your model. And uh, while that may be a significant variable, it might show it as an ins insignificant variable due to presence of autocorrelation. Yeah, and see the main thing is uh, when you are modeling autocorrelation when you see like there's autocorrelation between the residuals the thing is if let's say there's an error in your first term so the error will be continued in the next coming upcoming terms right so that is why we assume that there should be no autocorrelation because if there is an autocorrelation the error will just flow so if you see there will be a wider gap between your actual values and your predicted values okay. so like that is yeah one of the reasons okay um uh, moving on, um, I guess you also uh, also worked on some um, fundamental analysis to examine, you know, the funds funds from BlackRock, Vanguard, Fidelity, State Street. So can you can you tell more about it? Like what was the overall yes. overall objective and what were you trying to do? Yes. So basically, uh, I was trying to analyze targeted funds. What targeted funds uh, is that when uh, when you when you decide to save money for your retirement, you choose a retirement date. Uh, for example, in your case, retirement date can be twenty sixty or or twenty seventy. So a targeted fund uh, will give you the opportunity to invest in all the possible asset classes there are out there. These as asset classes can include equity, uh, fixed income, commodities, and alternatives. So uh, with a target fund for 2070, you would have, since you have more time to retire, you can take more risk right now. And uh, there will be higher allocations towards equity. And there will be lower allocations towards fixed income. And as you move closer to your retirement date, your uh, allocation towards equity, equity will decrease and you will de-risk yourself and your allocation towards fixed income will increase. So basically what I did there was, our goal was to analyze uh, how different providers are de-risking their portfolio over time and how the returns of each targeted fund over time. So what we found out that BlackRock was one of the um, leading advisors to not de-risk the portfolio early. What that means that BlackRock felt that you could take more risk even if you're going into a retirement sooner than later. And the reason they did this, uh, uh, the reason they thought 
the reason of doing this was they were trying to make sure that you're able to capsulate or get more returns uh, right now rather than uh, getting passive returns from a fixed income investments. And the analysis here involved a lot of different measures. One of the measures that we use is alpha, uh, Jensen's alpha and tracking error and information ratio. So basically, uh, these tell us how much uh, your targeted fund or in any kind of mutual fund is differing from your benchmark. What is the excess returns that are being produced from the benchmark? No, sure. So yeah, I guess you covered it pretty, you know, pretty nicely because I was about to ask you, you know, about Jensen's alpha and sort, you know, comma ratio. But yeah, I, I, I understood like, you know, the concept. Uh, let me ask you a few, few because I see like you have studied various coursework at your master's, like derivatives, um, risk management, optimization, Python. So I, I want to ask a few questions on, uh, you know, all of these. So mm -hmm. I'll start with, um, I'll start with time series analysis. Uh, do you know time series analysis? Yes. Okay. So can you tell me like, what do you mean by stationarity in a time series? Sure. Uh, a time series is said to be stationary when it's a, when the certain properties of a time series don't change with time and they're not dependent upon time. These properties are mean, variance, and covariance. Uh, so what it means is that uh, your uh, mean stays constant with time, your variance stays constant with time, and your covariance stays constant with time. Uh, these properties help us to analyze the time series more efficiently and more rigorously than a non-stationary time series. Right. And do you know some statistical tests, like any statistical tests, uh, which we can use to understand if the time series is stationary or not? Sure. One of the uh, tests uh, that is involved here is the augmented Dickey-Fuller test. The Dickey-Fuller test uh, basically has two hypotheses. The null hypothesis that we assume here is that the, uh, a time series is not stationary. And the alternate hypothesis we assume is that a time series is stationary. Uh, the test, we, we run the Dickey-Fuller test and we get a T-critical value and uh, we get a P-value. So if your P-value is uh, greater than point. Uh, 005, we, we do not reject the null hypothesis and we say uh, that the time series uh, is not stationary. Okay. Okay. So basically you mean uh, when the P value is greater than 0 0.05, the time series is non-stationary, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That, that sounds good. So let's say if you found out that using the augmented decay fuller test, you found out that the time series is non-stationary. So how would you like? Uh, how would you convert a non-stationary uh, data to a stationary data? Uh, so there's several ways to do that. Uh, one of the reasons why the time series cannot uh, is non-stationary because it has certain components like seasonality and uh, cyclic cyclicality which makes it non-stationary. Uh, one of the steps we can to make it stationary is just remove these components. Uh, so basically, a time series is made of trend, season, and cycl cycl yeah, yeah. I cyclic understand. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. Yeah. So if you remove the seasonality component of it and the cyclicality component of it and the trend component of it, you would get a time series that is uh, stationary. Another me method you can use is called differencing. Differencing is when you take the difference of two consecutive observations. Uh, what it does, what it does, is that it eventually smooths out your um, smooth out your time series and to make it uh, stationary. Some other methods you can probably use is smoothing like exponential smoothing and moving average smoothing. These also help you to reduce, uh, to make it a stationary time series. And also like one more thing is you can use log transformation that also like helps you, yeah. But yeah, your over, overall answer was good, yeah. Um, so can you tell me like what is the difference between autoregressive term or to, what is like the difference between autoregressive model and a moving average model? Sure. Yeah, take take your time. Yeah. Yeah, take so, your time. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. So in an I mean, auto yeah. auto regressive model, you assume that you are uh that the independent variable that you're trying to predict uh is dependent upon the past values uh, of itself and you lag it. Uh so basically the equation of it is as follows, uh, the y t is uh, equal to uh, theta one uh, y t minus one theta two y t minus two plus a constant term, and you can uh, move it forward to how many terms you want. And a moving average model is basically when you're trying to uh, model your white noise. Um, 
your white your white noise or the error term is basically a geometric uh, ground in motion or a random walk and uh, you lag uh, each value uh, you basically regress uh, the white noise today with a uh, lagged values of the white noise yesterday the day before that and the day before that um, so let's jump on derivatives um, can uh, can you tell me some of the differences between forwards and futures sure uh, so first of all, uh, forward forward contracts are contracts in which two counterparties come together and they fix uh, certain conditions to be satisfied on a certain uh, time or date. Uh, while futures contract is something that is done over an exchange. Uh, so forward contracts are not done over an exchange. Future contracts are done over an exchange. Forwards are not standardized. Futures are standardized. Forwards are only settled at the time of delivery, while future contracts are settled daily. Um, forward uh, in a forward contract, you can take delivery. Either you can take the delivery of the product, like for example, if you entered in a forward contract to buy to buy oil, either you can take the delivery of oil or you can settle it in cash. However, future contracts are always settled in cash, and um, or you can even settle a future contract before. Uh, the expiration of a, a future contract or the date of maturity of a future contract. A few more things to add is because, um, like if you see a future contract, they have a central party in between, right? Between, let's say if you have A and B, we have a central party between A and B. So that means there's less counterparty credit risk because like yes. the chance of default is less because the central party makes sure like uh, both the parties are posting uh, posting balances right and yes. whereas if you see um, forwards they are more of you know one to one like uh, a will directly you know speak to b or something trade with b or something like so this that counterparty so, risk involved uh, in yeah, uh, right. forwards while in futures there is no counterparty risk and that is measured that is just taken in uh, by the ccp involved Right, CCP rights. And also one more thing is, uh, if you see forwards, because uh, if you see futures, they are traded over the exchange. That's why they are more liquid instruments. And okay. if you see forwards are traded over the counter, so they are less liquid. So these yeah. are like a few more points to it. But yeah, you, you covered it all. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me like what, what does it mean by arbitrage, you know, hedgers, speculators? Sure. Uh, so let's begin with speculators. Uh, the easiest way to define a speculator would be a random person like me who's trying to see whether the market will go up tomorrow or go go down tomorrow. There's no um, there's no theoretical knowledge behind it. It's just you're trying to speculate where the market will be uh, in the future. A hedger is someone uh, like a producer or a seller of something. Uh, if they have a hedger is someone who's trying to. Uh, control the risk uh, of a bet that they have placed, uh, whether that bet can be producing uh, corn, uh, oil, or tomatoes, or whether uh, it's a bet that the stock price will go up. You can hedge uh, your bet using a different, um, a different instruments in the market. What hedging means is just to control the risk of your of the bet that you place in the market and arbitrage is trying to find opportunities in an you know, in an inefficient market and trying to exploit those opportunities to your benefit right right no i yeah, agreed um so like what are some common types of derivatives that are traded in the market can you like tell me yeah sure uh, the most common type of derivative that trade in the market is options uh there after options you have interest rate derivatives like fras frns caplets flowlets um uh, well, then I think these are all the derivatives that there are, or interested swaps and CDSs and uh, all this kind of derivatives as well. Right. Um. Okay. Yeah. Understood. So let's say. Um. Um. Okay. Let's let's understand. Like, uh, can you tell like what are Greeks and what are some common types of Greeks that have been like that have been considered by you know risk managers or traders? Sure. Uh. So Greeks are basically. Um, I don't know how to accurately describe Greeks, but they're just some basic, uh, the basic foundations behind an option pricing uh, and how an option behaves. Uh, some of the Greeks uh, that we see are Delta, Gamma, Rho, Vega, Theta. Uh, Delta is just the first derivative of uh, your change in, Delta is basically the change in your option price with respect to change in your underlying asset price. 
um, your gamma is the second derivative of de uh, your change in prices, and it's the first derivative of delta. Then uh, your vega is the derivative is your uh, first derivative of how the volatility changes with respect to the underlying asset price, and then your theta is how how much uh, is your time decay and your time maturity is affecting your option, and rho is how much the current interest rates in the market is affecting your option. Uh, so yeah, that is true. There are two corrections which I wanted to do. So basically, the way you can defend Greeks, not a correction, but a suggestion, right? I mean, the way you can defend Greeks are basically if let's say you are you have taken a positions in the market, Greeks tells Greeks are uh, Greeks tell what are the risk associated in the in that position. So basically, it tells what are the risks associated with the options. So again, as you said, delta gamma rho theta vega some common Greeks, and also wanted to correct you on uh, when you said about uh, rho. So when you said like it basically captures the change in uh, change in option price with respect to change in interest rate. So we can so it is not interest rate; it is risk free interest rates. So that is like one because if you see in the derivative pricing world, we are dealing with risk free interest rate every time. Yeah, <laughs> so so that is like one small small thing. Yeah. Sure. Um. Okay, so can you tell me like what is what do you mean by moneyness of the option? Uh, moneyness is a very simple concept in which uh, so when you so when you're trying to buy an option, uh, you basically tell what is the strike price of an uh, you basically specify a strike price. Strike price is is where you see where the option will end up. If you're trying to buy a call option, um, and imagine your current stock price is hundred right now. And you buy a call option with a strike price of 110. If your stock reaches the price of 110, uh, it will be an, an add the money option. That means you're in the money right now. And then uh, if your stock prices reach to 120, when your strike price is 110, that means you're deep in the money. And for example, if your strike price was 150 and a stock is $10 today, that is deep out of the money or out of the money option. Yeah. And like what is the range of delta for call option versus range of delta for a put option? Sure. So for a call option, a delta range is from zero to one. And for a put option, a delta range is from negative one to zero. Like if you, if you can you break down like what will be the delta for at the money, in the money, out of the money? Yes. Uh, so in both the cases, your delta for at the money will be 0.5. Uh, for example, in call, it will be plus 0.5. And for put, it will be negative 0.5. Uh, for in the money options, your delta would be from 0 0.5 to 1. And for, for a call option, for an out of the money call option, your delta will be from 0 to 0 0.5. Uh, similarly, for a put option, uh, if you're in the money, your delta would be point, negative 0 0.5 to negative 1. Uh, and if you're out of the money, your delta will be 0 to negative 0.5. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Uh, also, like coming on to gamma, you mentioned like it basically it's like the first order derivative of delta. So can you tell when like when is gamma uh, uh, when is gamma highest for a call option? Sure. So gamma is always highest as for a call option when it's at the money. The reason for this is that at the money, there are a lot of fluctuations that can happen and that can take you either out of the money or either in deep in the money. So due to those fluctuations, your change in delta is highest at that point and hence your gamma is highest at that point. Okay. Can you tell like what is the concept of volatility smile and smiles and derivatives? Sure. Uh, so volatility smile is basically a volatility curve uh, across different maturities uh, of options. And uh, these, the how volatility smile is constructed is that you calculate the implied volatility uh, from the price of an option. Once you have an once you have the implied volatility, you can uh, basically plot it against different strike prices. And with each strike price, you'll um, you'll create an x and uh, x y plot, and you'll get a scatter plot. And from the scatter plot, you'll see a smile like curve being formed, and that'll be the volatility smile. So it's basically a graph between implied volatility and different match and different strike price, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um. So, um, can you tell me, like, uh, let's say, what is the difference between implied volatility and historical volatility? Sure. Uh, implied vol volatility is something that is calculated from the current option price. Um. Uh. 
if you have the current price price and option using the black shoes model for the for the European option, you can back out the volatility out of that. That will be your implied volatility as right now. And the historical volatility, I think, would be just uh your volatility in the price returns of the stock. So so I guess the difference is historical volatility is what we have assumed, what we have seen, right? Uh, for any stock up till date, right? So that is what we say as historical. Implied volatility is the future volatility. Like basically, yeah. if you see, even in Heston model that you did, you were trying to predict the implied volatility, right? Predict the volatility. So when you predict the volatility, we say that as an implied volatility. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Um, so can you tell like uh, some common models other than Heston, which, uh, which we can use for uh, modeling implied volatility? Hmm. Oh, actually, I don't have any clue about this. Yeah, so, so there are a few volatility models like Arch, Garch, T Garch, and you know some extensions of Garch. Uh, even Yuma model, which is like EWMA model. So these are some common models which you can use to forecast volatility. Got it. Um. So moving on to risk management topic, can you define like what is value at risk? Sure. Uh, so value of value at risk is basically the maximum or the extent of losses that can occur in a certain uh, give uh, in a certain amount of time given a certain confidence level. Can you give some some examples of it? Like uh, if I say yeah. So for example, if you have a stock portfolio of a thousand dollars and you calculate uh, the value at risk uh, uh, is a hundred dollars uh, for the model. Uh, for a 5% confidence interval, it'll basically tell you that the maximum loss that can happen 95% uh, of the times is um, your $100. And however, it doesn't measure the maximum extent of losses that can happen 5% of the times. Right. Okay. And uh, can you tell me like what is the concept of uh, expected shortfall or conditional value at risk? Yeah. Sure. Uh, expected shortfall is actually a better measure than value at risk because it takes the average of all the possible losses that can occur, um, and that can occur given a certain period, a certain confidence level, and uh, basically expected shortfall is a better, um, better metric because, uh, you can know what are the, what is the average extent of losses given. Um, one percent of chance, or given five percent of chances. So basically, you are trying to say, like, if if let's say we are considering a ninety five percent value at risk, so expected shortfall is basically losses after uh, after the value at risk point at five percent of the tail, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Um. Yeah. So um. Okay. So like, can you tell me like which property of value at risk? Uh, you know, like which can be also like the limitations of it, which is covered by expected shortfall. Yes, so value at risk is not additive. So what that means is that uh, if your portfolio, which consists of two stocks A and B, your value of risk for portfolio wouldn't be just value of risk of A plus value of risk at B. So it doesn't follow that simple additive property, while expected shortfall kind of solves that problem. Yeah. Okay, understand. Any do you know like any methods like or like some methods to calculate value at risk? Uh yes. Yeah. So there are three methods that we can use to calculate value of value at risk. First of all, it's a parametric method. Second is a Monte Carlo method. Third is a, a historical method. Uh, in the first method, the parametric method, you assume that your stock returns follow a given set of distributions, and then uh, over over those using that distribution data, you can uh, calculate the quantile uh, in which your maximum losses will fall in. And then you can calculate a value of losses through that. Um, understood. So, so let's say, let's say we assume that the stock follows normal distribution. Okay. Uh, like which is like a very you know common assumption right in in the stock in the stocks but if you see the pandemic right or if you see 2007 8 financial crisis uh, we we see that most of the stocks they do not follow a normal distribution so what yes. other distributions can you use for more for modeling stocks uh, um so the reason that we use a normal distribution is because uh, the tails of a normal distribution are kind of lighter 
than other distributions like um, uh, like the student distribution. Uh, that means that the extent of losses that can occur are lesser uh, as compared to a student distribution. But you can also use a student distribution to model those. However, what I would do is rather than using a different distribution, I would do a long normal transformation of the data and convert it into a try to convert it into a normal distribution. Yeah, uh, understood. Okay, that makes sense. So, um, so yeah, that's all. Uh, that's all. That all. That's like all the questions that I had. Uh, thank you for joining in. Uh, you know, like uh, I feel confident about you, and we'll we'll talk later. Yeah, we'll uh, like the HR will reach out to you for next round. But at least for this mock interview, uh, <laughs> you were great. Uh, let me stop this recording because uh, I guess overall uh, interview was great and like there are one or two points which I want to highlight. Uh, let me yeah. stop this. Yeah.